Hi, my name is Father Janus. I'm a priest of the Diocese of Ljubljana and of the Emmanuel community and currently responsible for the youth on the international level. I'd like us all to enter today into the very mystery of God's love, which has manifested in Jesus dying on a cross. This is the mystery that we celebrate today on a Good Friday. Um, we will celebrate the liturgy of the Good Friday in the evening and that as such is the way how we can um, enter into the very mystery. But what I suggest um, right now is that we simply read the narrative um, according to the Gospel of John, when he says what happened on a cross. So we'll take the Gospel of John from 1838 through 1942. And so those two sources put together should be the best way how we could um, enter into the mystery of God's love for us. Before I... Um, go into the chapter 19, which is basically the chapter which speaks about the crucifixion and the death of our Lord. There's a few verses of the chapter 18 which are, well, which can serve as an introduction to the chapter 19, and those verses are the, uh, the ones which speak about two personalities. There is the personality of Yeshua and the other one of Barabbas. Um, what is interesting is that Barabbas is freed to go because Jesus accepts to go into death on a cross. Well, we know the, the story, all the Gospels tell us that this is what happened. What, what I find interesting is that if we take the meaning of those two names, we have Yeshua, which means God saves, so Yeshua is the one who steps in accept, accepting the death on a cross so that Barabbas would be freed. And Barabbas means very simply the son of the father, which is a good introduction, I think, into what we celebrate today. Everything that has happened with Jesus on the cross has a goal, and the goal is that we could become the sons and the daughters of the father. So let's go into the chapter 19 of the Gospel of John. The very first thing that pops up from the chapter 19 is Jesus as a king. We see that in the very first part of the whole chapter, and we especially see how Jesus and the, and the Pontius Pilate face each other and what Pilate thinks about the idea that there's the king of Jews in front of him. If we take the very first verses, first of all, Pilate had Jesus flogged, which is nothing new. All the Gospels speak about that. But Pilate makes it a part of the crucifixion, not just a possibility of maybe not having him crucified. Second of all, Jesus received the crown of thorns and a purple robe, which of course underlines the fact that, well, there is some kind of a king in front of us. The third step is Jesus brings, I'm sorry, Pilate brings Jesus um, out and he shows him to the people. And of course, through that, he shows what he thinks about the fact that he's a king, how absurd it is in his eyes. And the fourth step is the very words that Pilate says, here is the man in Latin, ecce homo, very famous words, where um, Pilate not just shows what he thinks about Jesus, but he also says what, what's his opinion on it. So to say, um, in Rome, there's nobody who can come as a king and who can endanger his, um, his power that he has. Well, Pilate goes on in Verse 14, we read, Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. The answer is amazing. The people say, We have no king but the emperor. 
so the Roman Emperor, which is the fact that not only they don't accept Jesus, who is the, the revelation of God the Father in Israel, but they also deny the very core of their faith, the very core of their faith, faith where God is their only ruler. They have the temple in the middle of the country, which means that God is among his people and he is the only one to have the authority over the people. They read the Torah, well, they read the scripture, which means that they rely only on the authority of the word of God and not of the emperor, Roman or whatever other emperor. And that is not only an amazing um, answer to this, here is your king Israel, but it's also a very tragic answer because it shows that there's unwillingness to accept the manifestation, the revelation of God's love in Jesus Christ as we discover it in the Gospels and as we see that there are a lot of people who recognize it, who, who say we believe in the manifestation of God in Jesus, we believe He is the only God, He is the Messiah. Let's look at Pilate real quick. It's very interesting how John describes his personality and his role. We know that in the other Gospels, Pilate is kind of half guilty. You know, he washes his hands. There's the high priests who are very involved, who are very interested in, um, in Jesus crucified. Whereas in the Gospel of John, Pilate is a very proactive person. He is the one to decide. He is the one to, to kind of seem guilty of the decision. But at the same time, this very same Pilate, he says a few words which are super prophetic, and those are precisely those two. First one is, here is the man, and the other one, here is your king. Although he is the, the ruler in a political sense, which is you know, decisive for Jesus' death, at the same time, he is kind of used to say certain prophetic words. One of the two is, here is the man. Basically, this phrase is, of course, written with an intention. We find this very same phrase just once in the whole Old Testament, and it is in the first book of Samuel, chapter 9, verse 17, where we read, when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man, Ekche Homo, of whom I spoke to you. He is who shall rule over my people. Well, wasn't the Pilate doing precisely the same thing? What in the Old Testament, the prophet um, kind of had an interior um, wisdom to know who is the one whom the Lord chose. Well, pretty much the same thing, or kind of a similar thing, Pilate did, maybe through the inspiration of the Spirit. Anyway, he showed to him, saying, here is the man. And of course, this was going towards Jesus as the king. John made this link between what Pilate says, here is the man, and between what the the Lord says to the prophet about the king to become Saul, who will, as the text say, rule over my people. Well, Jesus, when he is the king, he especially wants to say, my kingdom is not according to the political standards. This is what Pilate, so to say, thinks, that because he has a political power, he will overcome Jesus. But Jesus as a king in the chapter 19, or let's say Jesus on the cross, is not the one who is having the power which is political, but he has the power because he is a humble God made man. That's the power that Jesus has, and that's kind of the king which we have in the text 
and ultimately that's the king we have on a cross, of course. And that's precisely where we have the last moment when we see Jesus as the king and it is explicit and it's above his head on the cross. Um, there's three languages which we can read and they all say Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, written in Hebrew, Greek and Latin as the, the Gospels tell us. And it is explicitly that Jesus is understood as the king and because we have the three languages written it means that every single person or more or less could read and understand what is written on, on above his head which means that Jesus um, is presented to us not only as God humble which gives himself to us but also as a God who wants to give his life for everyone the fact that the, the little phrase of this is the king of Jews is written in all those languages means that all the nations, or well, we could understand it this way, all the nations can read and understand it. And because we can understand it, we can accept him as the king. And this is kind of the confirmation of what Daniel said in his prophecy when he wrote in the chapter 19 sorry 714 where we read to him was given the dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed Jesus said to the Samaritan woman that the salvation comes from the Jews, and she wasn't a Jew, she was a foreigner. Um, what Jesus announced is now becoming truth. So he becomes the salvation not only of the Jews, but of all the nations. What he was speaking about is now in front of our eyes. And we're in it. We're also among the nations, for the most part of us, for sure. Um, so to wrap up this first aspect, Jesus as a king. Well, it is important to know what kind of Jesus, what kind of God made flesh do we have in front of the eyes. On one hand, it's the king. It's pretty clear from the text. But on the other hand, it's the king who is completely humble. He's humble in front of the, pil the Pontius Pilate, but also he's humble to accept the human um, condition, and especially to accept the death on a cross. And this is the manifestation of God's love, of Father who operates the work of salvation for all the human flesh. What's the official reason for Jesus' execution? Well, it was blasphemy, a man who thought or who made himself God. John 10, 33, we read, the Jews answered, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, though only a human being, are making yourself God. And pretty much the same thing we read in 19.7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. But the one who is a, a disciple, he knows that it's not true. Jesus didn't make himself God. He simply was God. John doesn't ask himself whether Jesus is God or not, but he rather gives an answer to what kind of God he is or how does he live his divine identity. What is very um, typical for him is that this very chapter has a framework and it is the Paschal Mystery. We need to at least a little bit understand what was the Paschal Mystery for the Jews. There's two major aspects to it. There's the sacrifice, of course, of the Lamb, and then there's the communion. The Paschal Mystery was lived during the dinner, but there was especially these two important elements. So what John does is that 
he explains the nature of God, Jesus, through the context of the Paschal mystery. What we, where we see this is precisely in his little commentaries. There's two words which are the key words um, so that we could understand that it's going, that it's about the Paschal mystery. There's an hour and the day. About the day, John says it was the day of preparation. Well, in, if we would to translate this word, we would simply translate it into Friday before the Paschal day. So it was Friday before the Saturday on which the Pascua was celebrated. And the time, he says, it was the sixth hour, knowing that Jews counted the day from the 6 a.m. until 10 p.m., which means that the sixth hour was very simply noon. And that was precisely the moment when the lambs were sacrificed in the temple of Jerusalem. It was Friday before Pascua, starting at noon. And that's precisely when Jesus entered his passion, according to John. And of course, this gives a very strong framework to say what is going to happen with Jesus is precisely a Paschal mystery. Not the Old Testament, but Jesus' Pascua, which means the new Pascua, new Passover. In John 1, 29, we read, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then in 1, 36, 37, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. We've basically known that Jesus is the Lamb of God through the whole text of the Gospel. That's nothing very new. But what is new here in the 19th chapter is that Jesus commits himself, he gives his life. And that is what tells us about how God is. Not that he gives a commandment that we should, as a family of God, celebrate the Paschal mystery and so live the communion with him, but he becomes one with us. He becomes communion with us because he doesn't give the commandment but he gives himself. And that's the qualitative step forward. And that is his new Paschal mystery. That is ultimately the Eucharistic mystery that we can live almost every day. In Exodus 28, 4, we read, these are the vestments that they shall make, a breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a checkered tunic, a turban, and a sash. When they make these sacred vestments for your brother Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests, and so on. And then in Leviticus 16, 4, we read, He shall put on the holy linen tunic and shall have the linen undergarments next to his body. So what do those texts tell us? Well, they tell us that there were priests in the Old Testament who wore exactly the same garment as Jesus did on the cross. And they wore them with a very precise goal. And that goal was to sacrifice the lamb in the temple. Which means that John presents us Jesus on the cross, who is the lamb of God, but also who is a priest, which joins very well, very nicely, the theology which we have um, and what of what is going on at the Eucharist. Because there we have Jesus who is sacrificed, but at the same time we have Jesus who is operating the sacrifice in the person of, of, of a priest, which, which I think helps us understand what's going on at the cross and at the same time what's going on at our mystery, the Eucharist. And then there's another third element just to confirm that Jesus is establishing a new Passover and it's the hyssop branch. The hyssop branch was used in the very first Passover to put the blood on the doors so that death wouldn't touch Israel. And if we have the same hyssop branch in during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the Christ, then it is of course on purpose. Jesus wants to underline 
that we are speaking about the new Passover of Jesus Christ. If I go back just real quick um, to the garment which Jesus wore, what the text underlines is that the garment was one and it had to stay one. You, should, you shouldn't divide the garment. Well, what we can read there is because the garment was touching the skin of Jesus Christ, we can see that not just the garment had to stay one, but the whole body of Jesus Christ had to stay one. This is what the texts insist upon. So to say, you can, you can kill Jesus Christ, you can put him into death, but ultimately there is an integrity to his body, to his personality. And that is because he gives his life and you can never take him away. His intention is to keep his integrity because he, because he is divine so that we who are human could enter into this integrity of divine life. So let's move forward to the verses 24 to 27 when we have the words of Jesus on the cross and we have Mary, his mother, and we have disciple whom Jesus loved, but we know that it is the Apostle John. It's a, it's a place, it's words that can have a lot of interpretations, a lot of suggestions, and there have been a lot of them. What I suggest is that we only stick to the text as it is and not go too far as I have maybe um, done until now with uh, the Paschal Mystery. So what we have here is a very interesting situation that Jesus says, Mother, here is your son, and then he says to the disciple, here is your mother. So first we have the, this figure of the mother. Mother Mary, according to St. John, appears only twice in the Gospel. The first time is almost in the very beginning of the Gospel, in the chapter 2, when there is a wedding at Cana and the mother of Jesus was there, as the text says, and Jesus talks to his mother as woman. The same thing as he does in the chapter 19, where we are, where the text says that the mother of Jesus was under the cross, at the foot of the cross, and that Jesus said, woman. So there's those two words which pop up in the chapter 2 and in the chapter 19, just these two times. What we have um, in the chapter 2 is Mother Mary, yes, but we also have the fact that John describes the figure in a very general sense so that that figure could become, or precisely a figure, so that we, we wouldn't only think about the mother of Jesus, that we would understand in her, through her, a personification of the whole Israel. The same thing for the mother of Jesus or the woman, uh, the word which Jesus uses, at the foot of the cross. So what, what happened with the mother of Jesus or when Jesus says woman at the wedding in Cana? There we have Mother Mary, who is presented as a woman, that is, as Israel, because Israel is the daughter of Sion. So there's a woman which has a hope and which has an expectation because she awaits the ultimate um, salvation, the ultimate intervention from God in the uh, in the people. That is the hope which she clearly expresses. And then if we pass to the chapter 19, there is no more hope, but there is realization because she can see that there is the ultimate divine intervention in Israel. That's very mysterious because you know one wouldn't think that this would be the way how God would intervene in his people. But what we have here is not that she is the only one, that she's alone on, at the foot of the cross, but we have her son at the side. So we have the disciple at her side. 
which is the difference uh, between Cana and the cross. So why do we have disciple at the cross? Now, John didn't have just a hope to see the ultimate intervention of, um, of God in his people, because John, a few chapters back, he was already at the breast of Jesus. He was listening to his heart. So he's the one who received the fullness of revelation, and he also received the authority to interpret this, in, uh, this revelation. So he is, so to say, the perfect disciple of Jesus and his um, revelation. So if we have the two of them, you know, one helps the other one. The woman who is Israel, and Israel is expecting the ultimate um, revelation or intervention from God, and we have a perfect disciple who is fed by the hope and faith of Israel, of the woman, but at the same time, she's, uh, he is a guarantee that this faith is real in Jesus who is crucified in the Lord. So, in other words, not to go too far, we have here the fullness of the faith of Israel, which becomes flesh in the very proclamation of the gospel itself. This short scene with Jesus, Mother Mary, and also John, finishes with this little verse. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Well, this is some kind of announcement of what Jesus, God on the cross, has or can offer as a fruit. There's two, two things. The first one is from that hour. It's, of course, the hour of the crucifixion. But what Jesus speaks about quite often is being elevated. So it's not just the moment of the crucifixion, but it's the crucifixion as the ultimate revelation of God's love. The moment of crucifixion is not a time and space, but it's rather the quality of how God reveals himself to um, the human beings. And that means that from that hour on, from now on, from then on, so to say, we have the full access to divine love. This is the first fruit of Jesus, God, on a cross. And the second one is, he took her into his own home. And this little word, home, is very significant. Because this is the very divine um, consequence of the one who believes and the one who is inspired by the faith of Israel. So take somebody who has the faith at home into one's own home means that you do exactly the opposite of being dispersed. So what God offers us as his own divine fruit is we become, that we become unified, that we become communion, that we become a family. And then comes the last moment, which helps us understand the nature of God. And it's his little phrase, I thirst. It's not the first time in the Bible that we hear talking about the thirst. Psalm 63, 1, for example, says, O oh God, you are my God, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Well, this is clearly speaking about the human flesh or the human being um, desiring the presence of God, of course. We also have John Oh, sorry, Jesus, who says, I thirst in the Gospel of John. In 4.7, we read, give me a drink. He was speaking to the Samaritan woman, of course. Well, all this to say that biblical thirst is, of course, um, physical. There is bodily thirst, but there is also a human thirst. And what we have here, so that we would understand the nature of God. Well, we have a desire of Jesus, divine desire, which is to outpour the Holy Spirit on all the human flesh. And this is very beautiful. It hasn't happened, but the desire is already there. So to wrap up this second part, which kind of spoke about Jesus, God on the cross, 
it should help us understand the nature of God. Well, first of all, to recognize that the one who is crucified is God. And then the second step is that we would understand that through his cross, we have a communion with him. Jesus establishes his new Paschal mystery, which is he in the center, and we are gathered in the communion with him. So we come to his home, so to say. And then the third thing is that there's nothing else, nothing more to the revelation. The re revelation of God is full. Of course, the divine mystery is greater than what we can understand. But everything that the human being should know and everything essential to God's love has been revealed on Jesus on the cross. So let's go to the next and final step which um, speaks about Holy Spirit. We are still with Jesus on the cross, chapter 19 of John, but at the same time there are so many elements which clearly speak about the desire of the Holy Spirit that we simply have to say, well, this last part is all about the Holy Spirit. Let's begin with Jesus' word, it is finished. In Greek, the, what the written in the text is tetelestai, which means, properly speaking, to complete or consummate or to finish in a qualitative way the necessary process. That's what's going on with Jesus on the cross. And this process with the results rolling over to the next level of consummation. The verb is in perfect tense and it's in the middle voice. What is it? Well, the modern languages, we know the passive or the active voice, which are interchangeable. So I can kick the ball or the ball can be kicked by me. But the Greeks, they knew another voice, which is nothing, which has nothing, well, it's not that connected to passive active voice, and it's the middle voice. And what we have here is the middle voice, which is used. So it's not Jesus doing this or this being done by Jesus, but we have a result, which is after, which comes after the act having been completed. So it's not that much linked to what Jesus does, but it's also especially to say that what Jesus does has a consequence, and this consequence is there, available, and no one can prevent it from bearing the fruit. This Jesus' words, I guess, echo um, two realities. The first one is, the very creation of the world, where we have a lot of words which go towards acting, towards creation, towards working. And so if you start creating, there comes a moment when you finish your work. And so we have a little bit of this in Jesus' work, it is finished. Well, the work that he started is finished. We have the first work, which is the, the work of creation, in Genesis 2-2, we read, And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he has done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So if we have the first creation, which was finished, and then God rested, then we have the new creation, which we have in Jesus on the cross, and then he, in, in this very moment, Jesus says, it is finished. Well, the work of the new creation is finished. And then there is another echo, a second echo, which is, of course, the echo to the very Paschal mystery, which I mentioned. And it is simply because the Paschal dinner, the Paschal celebration, had four cups. It's the famous point with four cups. And it's clear that the Gospels only mention three cups. So what Jesus did was he celebrated the Paschal dinner, which had, which had to have four cups. But Jesus only took three of them. And after the third one, 
he left the room, went into the garden, and the next day he was crucified. So there's a problem there. And what the Gospel of John says, that he, when being on the cross, took the cup of wine. So we could say, well, isn't that the fourth cup? And after having taken the fourth cup of wine, he says, it is finished. So not only the new creation, but what is finished is also the new Paschal mystery, which is new Jesus' Pascha. So that's why I thought there was Holy Spirit so much present in, towards the end of this chapter. So it is finished. What does it mean for us today? Well, it means that the new creation in Jesus is finished and we can be part of it. We can enter into the very communion with God and we can receive divine nature and we can live that at the Eucharist. That's where we become one flesh, we who are human flesh, with the flesh of Jesus Christ, who is divine flesh. Once again, the Spirit has not been outpoured yet. It will only happen in the chapter 20 towards the end of it. But what we have here is the condition, the physical condition, which leads to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is speaking about that. And he is acting in this way because he is very willing. He has life in his hands. And where we see that is not only this phrase, it is finished, where we have the physical completion of the work of the new creation in Jesus Christ. But there's another element which I find very interesting, and it is the fact that at the moment of Jesus' death, we read that he gave his spirit, and after that, he bowed his head, and then he was dead. That's when he was dead, let's say. Well, during the Gospel of John, Jesus was very often speaking that the condition for the Holy Spirit upon the human flesh is that he first has to go. Right? He has to finish the work and then go. And so now we say, we, we see, I would say, the moment when he is departed. He gives his spirit, which means that he has the full control over his work. He's willing to actively participate in his work. And the condition for the Holy Spirit to be sent is precisely this work to be completed. So he has a great will to do it until the very last moment, which is his death. And then he bows the head and then physically speaking, there is nothing much more. Almost. The Gospel of John is, of course, very famous for his verse, which speaks about what has happened after the death of Jesus. Verse 34, we read, One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. So we have those two biblical symbols of water and of blood. Water being the source, um, well, the symbol being symbolizing the source, of course, and it is the healing source. And here um, it goes well beyond just the water, because the water ultimately is the symbol of the Holy Spirit, which is the healing power. Holy Spirit in us is eternal life in us. That's what we want as a healing. And then we have um, blood, which is on one side Jesus' passion. That's where we see, that's where we touch Jesus' blood. But also uh, we know that blood is life. That's why the Israelites wouldn't consume fresh blood, because blood is life and one should not um, take control of the life. So I want to wrap it up, I tried to go through the chapter of 19 of the Gospel of John. I didn't say everything, I didn't explain everything, I can't explain everything, of course, but I, what, what I wanted to do is to help us see a few elements so that we could better enter into the mystery of the Good Friday 
and through that so that we could enter into the mystery of God himself. I thank you all for watching this and I wish you a very, very blessed celebration of the Paschal Mystery.